from Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Hi. Pat Keller, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Good to hear your voice, Patsy. Thought you were transferred to Baltimore. That's where I am. Say, John, can you handle one for me? What kind of one? It's a life and accident policy. Eastern Fidelity paid off five years ago. A man named John Reardon was the insured party. He died in 1950. Wife was a beneficiary. It's a crazy one. Well, go on. Eastern wants us to look into the matter QT. One of their officers has reason to believe Reardon is still alive. Why would he think that? Because he saw him two days ago. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item one, $22.75. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Baltimore. I arrived at 3.15 in the afternoon at Friendship International Airport. It was a cold gray day. I took a cab directly to Pat Kelleher's office. <laughs> Good to see you, John. He was ten pounds heavier. Outside of that, he looked swell. Ah, uh, we'll have to have dinner. Once you week, my wife. Where are your bags? You didn't go to a hotel. I checked my stuff at the airport, Patsy. I didn't know how long I'd be here. Over the Alleghenies on the plane, I got to thinking about the number of alive but dead reports I've investigated at one time or another. They happen all the time, or they never pan out. Yeah, well, this one isn't like that, John. Sit down. Thanks. You no, know, and a man like Paul Coombs, chairman of the board for Eastern Fidelity, not to mention vice president of two oil companies and one construction company, when he romps in here and says somebody's still alive it's supposed to be dead, we got to listen to him. Sure you do, Pat. It's your job. Your job now. Coombs claims he not only saw Reardon, but talked to him. I'll go into that later. Policy was issued in 1944. Mm-hmm. The wife's a beneficiary. Yeah. Elizabeth Jane Reardon, $10,000. 20, John. Double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. Well, look, I'll look at this stuff later. Maybe you'd better tell me about that first. Okay. John Reardon was lost in a boat accident out on Chesapeake Bay. When? August 13th, 1950. There were four people in the party. They went out for the afternoon on a power cruiser, and the thing exploded in the middle of the bay. Oh, yeah, I may have read about it. Was there a man named Sharpston involved? Yeah, yeah, uh, Sharpston owned the boat. He and his wife were aboard, and another man named Blaine. Did all of them go down? That's right. They recovered Mr. and Mrs. Sharpston's body and Blaine's. They never found John Reardon. What caused the explosion? No explainable reason. It was never determined. Oh, there's always a reason. Yeah, well, that probably blew up with the boat, too. As it happened, we conducted the investigation for Atlantic States Limited. They held the insurance on the Sharpstons and the boat. These are our findings in the matter. We found no reason for Atlantic not to honor the claim made by Sharpston's estate. Mm-hmm. How about the other man who was killed, Blaine? His case was adjusted by another company. So that leaves us John Reardon. Yeah. About a month after the accident, his wife filed claim for payment. Our investigation was ended by then. We notified the insurance commissioner of the circumstances of his death and requested a judgment. Thirteen. Did it go through all right? Yeah. The appellate court declared John Reardon legally dead after the required three-year waiting period. Pretty standard when there's no body. Sure. Eastern honored the claim and paid Mrs. Reardon $20,000. So, that's about it. Except that now somebody thinks he's alive. Not just somebody. Paul Coombs. Yeah, yeah. And if that's so, Eastern's been swindled for $20,000. Tell me about the beneficiary. Miss Reardon? Mm hmm. Nice woman. Met her a couple of times. She didn't need money, I can tell you that much. Oh? Yeah, worth over $200,000. Never married again. You say she didn't file her claim until a month after the accident. That's right. She ever give any reason for waiting that long? Well, she was pretty broken up about it. The money wasn't important, particularly. Maybe she just forgot. Pat. I've got a question. What's that, John? How can you forget $20,000? Expense account item two, $10, for drinks I had with Pat Kelleher while we talked some more about the Reardon case. 
At 7 o'clock that night, I had on a fresh shirt and a press suit. They seemed to impress Paul Coombs, vice president, chairman of boards, etc. Dollar? That's right, Mr. Coombs. Universal adjustment. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come in, come in. I talked with Mr. Kelleher there. He sent you? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I recall your name now. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we can sit here, Mr. Dollar. Now, you hear about John Reardon, of course. That's right. I'm glad they sent a man like you. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it. You puzzle me, Mr. Coombs. No, I don't. And that's a compliment to your perceptive abilities, young man. As a matter of fact, you're here because you're only curious about me. You want to have a look at the man who thinks he saw John Reardon alive, right? I suppose so. You don't believe he is alive? I didn't say that. Hmm. I admire your caution. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it because, well, John Reardon was a close friend of mine. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I knew him for a number of years. And Mrs. Reardon. He was a fine, sensitive man. I'm sure you'll know how to handle him when you meet him. You sound very certain that I will meet him, Mr. Coombs. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Three nights ago at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver, Colorado, I saw John Reardon. I walked up and spoke to him. I talked with him for 15 or 20 minutes. I know it was him. He didn't admit it. He denied it completely. He told me his name was Frank Bauer and that he had lived in Denver ever since the war. Frank Bauer? Yes. I was so certain it was John Reardon, I insisted. He laughed at me. Seemed good-natured about it. Even bought me a drink. I see. I asked him where he had lived before Denver. He said something about Toledo. Uh I asked him if he'd gone to college there. He told me he'd gone to Ohio State. Told me he was an engineer, a mining engineer. Everything he told me seemed plausible and reasonable, except that all the time I knew he was lying. I knew his name wasn't Frank Bowers. That was John Reardon. How did you leave it with him? Well, the whole thing unnerved me somewhat. I'm afraid I looked like rather a fool. I simply caught my limousine out to the airport and came back here to Baltimore. Did you get his address in Denver? No. Any of his business connections, anything like that? No. Was he alone when you met him? There was no one with him. At the bar, he even ordered his drink the way John always ordered it. You know, like this. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people make that signal for two fingers of bourbon. Wore clothes the same way, too. Have you spoken of this matter to anyone outside of Pat Kelleher? No. No, I thought it should be looked into before I called up Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Reardon, John's widow. Oh, yes. It'll do no good bothering her just now. I'm afraid she'll have to be bothered. Why? Can't you investigate the information I've given you without upsetting everyone? With this kind of information, somebody's bound to get upset. Look, uh, don't put restrictions on me, Mr. Coombs, or we won't get anywhere. You say John Reardon was a close friend of yours. Yes. I presume his wife was, too. That's right. A lovely, lovely person. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind when I talk to her. Uh, Maybe you aren't the man for this. You can get somebody else, Mr. Coombs. No, no, no. It's just that I suddenly had a strange feeling about it all. Depressing. If John Reardon is alive, and you seem to be certain of it, then I understand your feeling. How's that? (laughs) Your friend's party to a $20,000 fraud, not to mention his wife. Possibly he's not as sensitive and she's not as lovely as you thought. I spent the rest of the evening with Pat Kelleher and his wife hoping to see the bright lights and listen to some laughter. We picked a couple of fancy bistros and started the rounds to watch champagne flow and eavesdrop on the happy stories of success, promotion, and love. But it didn't work. Like the place, John? It's swell. You're as low as a cricket's ankle. Well, today a man kept telling me a friend of his was alive who's supposed to be dead. He told me what a fine fellow this friend is, or was. Yeah. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, I tell him to go jump in the lake, but Paul Coombs comes under the title Reliable Witness in anybody's book. Give me a match. Here. How you fix for plans? Start somebody looking into Frank, whatever his name is, in Denver, who's supposed to be Reardon. I'll start with a beneficiary, but... Miss Reardon? Yeah. I'll march out and say, uh, let me look at some pictures of your husband. What kind of a guy was he? Did you enjoy each other or try to kill each other? Did you ever, uh, uh, why didn't Coombs look into it himself? Why didn't he go out to the widow and tell her about his meeting the guy in Denver? Because he came to us, John. Yeah, I know, Patsy, I'm sorry. But the prospect of going to somebody, anybody, with a flimsy story like that makes me sore. It might get her hopes up that her husband's alive. And that's a lousy thing to do. 
Reliable or not, Coombs is probably all wet. Probably. Sour racket. Sour racket. You being a parrot? Just being agreeable, John. If you want to be sad, I'll be sad with you. <laughs> we both know situations like this part of the trade. Oh, I should have been a... Oh, let's have another belt. Sure. Later. Well, John, mm -hmm. maybe another way to handle Mrs. Reardon with that. That's her over there at the bar. Nice, isn't she? Hey, she is lovely. Hmm? Uh, nothing. She looks a little tight. Yeah, well, I hear she gets that way quite a bit these days. Say, John, you want me to introduce you like a friend? It might make it easier. No, I'll handle it myself. Who's with her? Beats me. He's looking for a phone booth. Pat. Yeah. I may be able to find out what I want and not let her know what it's about. You mean right now? I mean right now. Hello. You're Elizabeth Reardon, aren't you? Oh, well, yes. Oh, probably you don't remember me. My name's Johnny Dollar. We met some time ago. I'm afraid I don't remember, Mr. Dollar. I'm in the insurance business. Don't remember? Well, where was it we met? <laughs> now I can't remember. May I sit down? Well, I'm expecting someone who'll be back in a minute. Yes. Would you care for a drink? I have this one. Thank you. Oh. How's John these days? John? Your husband, Mrs. Redden. His name is John, isn't it? My husband's been dead nearly five years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I I mean, it must be... <laughs> this is very awkward. That's all right. Five years? I could have sworn it was just three years ago I met you and John. In Denver. It couldn't have been. We were never there. Oh, well, pardon me. I... I sit here making bad conversation with you, and it's it's very apparent you're distressed. Look, I'm I'm very sorry I upset you. Is there anything I could do? No. No, Mr. Dolly, you didn't upset me. You look like a very nice person. How long are you going to be in Baltimore? A few more days. Perhaps you'll come out to the house for a drink before you go back. Say tomorrow. Oh, I'd like that, Mrs. Ridden. You can call me. I'm in the book. Mrs. John Ridden? Yes. I will. Again, I'm sorry that I brought... Do me a favor, Mr. Dollar. When you come to my house for a drink, call me Elizabeth. And please, don't mention my husband's name. I'd appreciate it very much if I never heard it again. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little talk to a widow who might not be a widow at all. And a strong feeling that a smile can sometimes be more dangerous than a gun. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Pat Kelleher at Universal. How'd you make out with Miss Reardon? I met her. She thinks I'm an insurance broker or something. I told her I knew her husband when he was alive. In 
industrial hazard lying. Part of the business, John. Did you find out anything that'll help you? I found out she's pretty upset about everything in the world. That's the only report you have for Universal Adjustment Bureau? Oh, she invited me for cocktails. I'm going to call her later this afternoon and keep the date. Maybe I'll get some information then. Cocktails, say You made out okay. Oh, shut up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item three, $23.60, long-distance telephone call to George Hanley in Denver, Colorado. George is an old friend of mine in the private detective business. I told him about the report that John Reardon was still alive and living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. I requested him to gather information that would help in determining whether Bowers was really John Reardon or not. I spent the remainder of the day reading over the facts of the case as supplied to me by Pat Kelleher of Universal Adjustment. Expense account item four, ten cents. Another phone call. This one to John Reardon's widow. Hello? Mrs. Reardon? Yes. This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. You're the man who used to know John? Uh, yes. I asked you over for a drink. I hope you're coming. What time? Seven would be fine. I was at her home at 7 o'clock, knocking on the door. It was a nice home, and she seemed like a nice person. Even nicer than the night before. I asked you to call me Elizabeth, Mr. Dollar. I remember her. Yes, you also asked me not to mention your husband's name. I wish you'd forget that. I was upset last night when we met. Forgive me? How's your drink? Not swell. I don't know why, but I feel I should explain myself a little more about saying what I did about John. I... I was very shocked at his death. I suppose I still am, even though it was five years ago. It always disturbs me when I'm reminded of it. Yet it's good to be reminded, I suppose, to know that he really is dead, that he won't come through that door anymore. That he won't telephone me from the office or make any plans with me? Does that make sense? I suppose so. Oh, we can drink another one. Sometimes things make more sense with a few drinks. <laughs> Sometimes they don't make any sense at all, Elizabeth. That's right, too, Johnny. You know, I like you. I like you. Tell me about your business. You said insurance? Yes. You're a broker? Well, uh, not exactly. A salesman? No. I'm an investigator. That must be terribly interesting work. I suppose you travel everywhere. Have you ever been to she had a nice mouth. Soft, frank, wide open eyes. A couple of times I was on the verge of telling her exactly what I was working on and why I was talking to her. But I didn't. Somehow I felt comfortable in the house. Over the drinks and music, we eventually got around to John Reardon. She told me of their four years' marriage that ended gave with his sudden death. Gave me everything I could possibly want to have. Oh. Why do I tell you all this? I never talked to anybody about it. Oh, I don't know. Possibly because you just want to talk to somebody about it. You're easy to talk to, Johnny. I was 19 when I was married. I'd never known another man. It was wonderful at first. Wonderful all the time, I suppose. I just wasn't grown up enough to realize it. Can I ask you a question? Surely. Did you really love him? Yes. I'm not convinced. Why? Oh, just a feeling. Well, I did. I'm not so sure he loved me. That's an awful thing to say. No, I don't think so. It's probably been on your mind a long time. 
You don't know me from a load of coal, but we've sat here and talked an hour. I think I know you. I think so, too. You still seem very despondent about his death. Yet you aren't sure he loved you. I loved him. Oh. <laughs> here I am explaining things again, I suppose, because they sound so foolish. Once we both loved each other. Very much. But we kicked it away. We just didn't get along. He was out spending his money on other people, and I was taking up this pastime. Can you tell when I've had too much? No. Thank you. Thank you awfully. Oh, Hugh. Elizabeth. Johnny, this is Hugh Bryan. This is Mr. Dollar, Hugh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. How's your drink, Liz? Fine. Now tell me again, who is this? This is Mr. Dollar. What's your business, Mr. Dollar? I haven't seen you around before. Obviously, you just met Miss Reardon, or you would never, never start drinking with her. I wouldn't. No. That's true, Liz, isn't it? He was a friend of John's, Hugh. Well, that's nice. I don't think I ever heard him mention your name. I was a friend of his, too, as a matter of fact... His attorney. Hugh, you don't have to do this and in And since John me. is no longer here, I've undertaken to look after some of the problems he left behind him, as an old friend would. Elizabeth, say good night to Mr. Dollar. Now look here, Hugh. Say good night are... to him. He's just leaving. Well, maybe it's better right now, Johnny. Good night. Do you want me to leave? She just said it would be better. I'll call you at your hotel. Good night. Good night, mister. No, no, you still have something in your glass. Finish your drink. Okay. Huh. An old friend of John's. That's good. Very good. It is? She picked you up in a bar last night. I saw her. I was with her. You never knew John Reardon in your life. You have no business being here. And I don't like cheap opportunists invading her home. Evidently, you can talk to her any way you want to, and she'll take it. Why, I don't know. But don't talk to me that way. I don't have to take anything. You were just leaving, weren't you? Hugh Bryan was a large, bristling sort of man with a smooth manner. I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. Expense account item five, $18. Even cab fares, lunches, etc. In and about Chesapeake Bay, talking to the principals connected with the boat explosion death of John Reardon. One of these was Lieutenant Jack Halverson, United States Coast Guard. You want some coffee? If I have to go out in that wind to get it, no. Make it right here for just such occasions. Just a sec, I'll plug her in. There. Oh, brother, someday. It's nice in the summertime. Now, what can I do for you? Tell me about the boat going down. You made out the report for the Coast Guard. You mean the Sharpstons boat? Yeah. We have a reliable witness who thinks that one of the passengers, a man named John Reardon, didn't go down with it at all, that he's still alive. You said you had my report. Those are the facts. But you picked up three bodies. Why not the fourth? Why not Reardon's? Well, we searched the bay for a solid week looking for his body. We used every piece of equipment at our disposal. We did everything we could. But you didn't find him. First you come in here complaining about our weather, now you're mad about the way we were on the Coast Guard. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a very lousy-sounding apology. What do you want to find out? How that boat exploded? Why you couldn't find Reardon's body if you found the others? Now, look, if a bunch of rich jerks want to take a high-powered boat out and they don't know the first thing about high-test fuel or engine running, they're doing it at their own risk. That help? Yes, yeah, some. I wish you could have put it on the report. That's my ideas, buddy. The report just has the facts. Now, for the other, about finding Reardon, I don't know why. He blew up, went down, or drifted out to sea. If his body had been in the bay, we'd found it. Was there a chance he might have survived and been rescued? All we had left of the boat was pieces of wreckage. And if he was rescued, it was never reported, and I wouldn't know about that. Could that have happened? Sure. I could be an admiral tomorrow, too. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when I got to Elizabeth Reardon's house. You. Hello, Mr. Bryan. Is Mrs. Reardon in? No. Then I'll wait. It's important that I see her. I thought I made it clear to you last night I didn't want her being molested. You did make it clear and cruel, Mr. Bryan. Now, I'm here... Any to... business for her comes to me first. I'm an insurance investigator. I know that. She told me. But she didn't tell you because she didn't know and I didn't want her to know. 
that I'm working on a case that involves her. What? I have a report that her husband might still be alive. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have to admit that Hugh Bryan's concern was as genuine as his surprise. He led me into the house and we sat at the bar. Only this time, no one had a drink. He listened while I told him about the report of Paul Coombs, that John Reardon was living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. Do you think there's any truth to him? It doesn't matter what I think, Mr. Bryan. I have to investigate it. Yes, of course. And if he were alive, it'd be the best thing in the world. Would it? Of course. She's been lost without him all these years. She needs him, Mr. Dollar. She always needed him. This little bit of drinking has been going on too long. These tearful little episodes with one man or another. Oh, yes, I mistook you for one of those last night. I apologize for that sincerely. Actually, Mr. Dollar, she... She's been quite a task. Uh-huh. Well, maybe i better talk to her now. Uh, do you have to? There's certain information I'd like to get. I think she's the only one who can give it to me. You'll have to tell her about the report? Yes. And there's probably so much talk. But it'll give her a terrible kind of hope. All right, I'll get her. Oh, you'd better mix one for her. She'll need it. W- wait a minute. Yeah? I need vital statistics on Reardon. Pictures, handwriting samples, everything. Could you help me gather them? I'll do anything I can. Well, then there's no need to bother her, is there? You're a gentleman, Mr. Dollar. I don't know why. I do. You don't want to hurt her any more than I do. An hour later, I was back in my hotel room. The next day, I had an appointment to meet you, Brian, and get all the material I had asked for. I was more depressed than ever about the case. About then, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny? Yes. This is Elizabeth Reardon. Please. Please don't look for him. What? Just forget it. Did Hugh Bryan tell you what I was about? I overheard you two talking. Don't bother with it. John's dead and that's that. Promise me. Promise you won't do anything else. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I have to investigate it. Johnny, is is that final? I'm sorry. I don't have any choice. Elizabeth? Elizabeth. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a trip to Denver and a look at a man whose gun makes it pretty emphatic that he doesn't want to be looked at. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hugh Bryan, Mr. Dollar. How are you this morning? Not so good. I didn't sleep very well. How'd you do? I think I have about what you want on John Reardon. Well, if you haven't, I can get it from Mrs. Reardon. What? Well, I thought you didn't want to tell her about the report that her husband might still be alive. She knows. She overheard us talking last night. Oh. Well, what do you want to do? 
I might as well look at what you have and get this over with. How about an hour from now? I'll be waiting for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item six, dollar and a half. One collect telegram from Denver, Colorado. I've located Frank Bowers as per your request. Cursory investigation discloses little evidence that would lead me to believe he might be the John Ridden of Baltimore. Looks like a ham bone to me, Johnny. What do I do now? Sign George Hanley, George Hanley Investigations Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Item seven, two dollars, same thing. Telegram from me. Things are about the same way here. Sit tight, I'll see you in a day or two. Love, Johnny. Once the telegrams were out of the way, I walked three blocks from my hotel to the office building of Hugh Bryan. It was an impressive place full of lawyers and doctors. Hugh Bryan looked a little haggard when I saw him. It took me a while to get all this together. Half the night. There wasn't that big a rush. Oh, get it out of the way. The sooner you have what you need, the sooner you can make sure, and the sooner I won't worry about it anymore. Uh, did you talk to Elizabeth yet today? No, just last night. Oh, I thought maybe she might have called you this morning. I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry for that girl. Well, don't feel too bad, Mr. Bryan. We both did everything we could to keep the report that her husband might be alive from her. Awkward as it was. Yes, I know, I know. I still don't understand it, I guess. Well, a man named Coombs, an insurance official, thinks he saw Reardon in Denver last week using the name Frank Bowers. He's sure that Bowers was Reardon. If he turns out to be Reardon, the insurance company has been taken for $20,000 they paid to Elizabeth Reardon, just to set you straight. Well, that'd make Elizabeth party to a fraud. And John. Lord knows that's silly. Oh, well, silly or not. Yes. Well, here's what I have. Now, uh, this is one of the last pictures taken of John Reardon. Mm-hmm. Have the negatives? Yes. Uh, here. And these are some vital statistics on him. The physical part I got from his doctor. Mm -hmm. He stood an examination about a month before the accident. This the doctor's name here? Yes. Now, these other things are in his background and education. Uh, here, a copy of his marriage license, birth certificate. How did you get hold of these things? Well, I handled a lot of business for John, filed a lot of his papers for him. These were just packed away. It took a while to find them. Hey. Hmm? A copy of his fingerprints? Well, would those help? More than any of this other stuff. Fingerprints aren't standard papers in anybody's file. Before John went in the Army, he did some engineering work for the Proving Grounds in Aberdeen. Oh. He was fingerprinted there. It was a gag at the time. He had a set of his own blown up and put on the wall in a picture frame. You know, just a joke. Yeah. I dug them out of his personal things. Now then, here's a copy of his financial records, tax returns and whatnot. I spent about an hour in Hugh Bryan's office going over material that would help me in the investigation. The pictures and fingerprints were the most helpful items. After I'd finished, I went back to my hotel, packed my bags, and checked out. Mm -hmm. Expense account item eight. $398, my hotel and incidentals in Baltimore and plane fare to Denver. I got there at 9 in the morning. The air crisp, thin, and full of sunshine. I rented a car at the airport and drove into town. A half an hour later, I was talking to my detective friend, George Hanley. How do you like Denver, old pal? I haven't been here for a few years. It doesn't look the same. Bigger and better, huh? They're thinking of putting up buildings as big as those mountains over there. I love it. So does the wife. I'm glad. You ought to try a place like this for a while, Johnny. Uh, maybe I will. Ought to find yourself a girl and settle down. Uh, let's us settle down, Georgie. Huh? Oh, sure. How'd it go? You asked me to look into Frank Bowers. I looked into him as much as I could without talking to him. There you are, Johnny. His bank account, his friends, his troubles, his enemies, everything. Mm -hmm. How about his police record? One traffic violation two years ago. Never been in any kind of trouble around here. Gets along fine with everybody. Well, tell me about everybody, Georgie. 
His laundry man, the milkman, the guy who tends bar in his neighborhood, the man he buys gas from. I talk to all of them. How about the people he works with? Well, he don't do much of that as far as I can see. He's got an office downtown, calls himself a consulting engineer. Goes there once or twice a week to pick up his mail. Well, now, that's a very nice way to be able to live. Is he starving to death, Georgie? No, he's got a good bank account. Makes regular deposits. Money comes from a New York bonding firm. He owns a little two-bedroom house out beyond Park Hill. Paid $38,000 for it. Wow. Sleeps in one bedroom. Uses the other one for a kind of studio. Putters around with clay, oils. And according to the nosy dame who lives across the street, he tries to write. How about his friends? Lots of them. Pays his bills. Gets drunk now and then. Normal. Tell me about his wife. He hasn't got one. Lives alone. Find out who he goes with, Georgie? No. As much as I could find out, he doesn't go with anybody. Enemies? Well, the guy in the cleaning shop hates his guts. Bowers doesn't like his shirts with starch. (laughs) Did you check out the residency business? As far as I could. He bought that house out in Park Hill in 1951. Paid cash for it. Record of the sale gives his former residence is Toledo, Ohio. Well, how long has he been a resident here? As near as I can figure, and this is just rough... Four or five years ago, the first financial transaction was the house he bought. The next was a car. He could have been here a long time before that, though. Well, the time element would fit for Reardon. What do you think, Georgie? I think you're probably wasting a lot of money investigating this guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who's hiding out from anybody. Here. Look at this photo. Is this Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. 5'11", 170, olive complexion, no scars, no glasses, brown hair, about 35. Could be him from that, yes. This is a picture of John Reardon, and the description is Reardon's. What do you want to do now? Keep on it. I got George Hanley busy making a check with some people in Toledo who could find out whether or not a Frank Bauer had once lived there. Then I took my rented car and drove out to the address Hanley had given me. It was in the east side of the city near the airport. A one-story frame house, a 53 Merc in the driveway. I'm looking for Mr. Frank Bowers. Oh, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I'm Frank Bauer. Well, I'm an insurance investigator, Mr. Bowers. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, come on in. Thank you. Take chair anywhere, huh? What's on your mind? Just making a routine check, Mr. Bowers. Thought perhaps you could help me. I don't know anything about my neighbors, if that's that kind of thing. No, I'm running down a report that came across our office in Baltimore. Baltimore? Ever been there, Mr. Bowers? No. Swell place on Chesapeake Bay. Well, I like Denver. (laughs) What's this all about? Well, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were at a place called the Ship's Tavern? Well, that's in the Brown Palace. This was uh, last Friday, to be exact. (laughs) Should I remember? What I do, steal an ashtray or walk out on a check? Oh, a, a man from Baltimore was there that day, Mr. Powers. His name was Coombs. Paul Coombs. You met him. Well, did I? Yes, right at the bar. You had a drink or two with him. Well, I might have. I don't know whether to admit it or not. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand this. I know it seems confusing. Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Now, you must admit, you look a great deal like the man in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I do. Well, I'll be darned. Hey, I'd do it that. You know, this could be a picture of me. That's why I'm here, Mr. Powers. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. His name was John Reardon. He was lost in a boat accident in Chesapeake Bay five years ago. The Mr. Coombs who met you at the bar here last week thought you were John Reardon. Well, I don't blame him. But I'm not. Close, though. Now... Want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Coombs was a lifelong friend of John Reardon's. I have his sworn statement here about that meeting with you and the certainty of his identity. You do? Yes, right here. Would you like to see it? (laughs) Not particularly. I understand you went to Ohio State. What year did you graduate? I didn't go to Ohio State. Look, what is this? Well, that's what you told Mr. Coombs. It's in the statement. Oh, I remember that bird now. Oh, I might have told him anything, Mr. Dolly. You know, he's one of those inquisitive kind, real sure of himself. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Look, don't tell me they sent you all the way out here from Baltimore. They did. On that guy say so? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Did you go to college, Mr. Powers? 
What? I'd like to clear up that detail. Did you go to college? Well, yes, yes. I went to Carnegie Tech, 36 through 40. You haven't lived all your life in Colorado, then. Where else have you lived? Look, do you have any right to ask me questions like this? No, no, but you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them. Well, why not? Okay, I've lived in New York, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Toledo, around the country. Came here a few years ago with my health. Seemed good for my asthma. Ever been married? Once in 1942. It didn't last long. Oh, what else you want to know? Well, look, you in a hurry? I can come back later. No, no, you... it's not that. It's Well, look, you seem like a nice guy, Dollar, but it just makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Bauer. Please understand, it's a matter of establishing identity. But you know who I am. I just told you. That's true. I don't like this business much. Is there, is there any way you can eliminate it? The most positive identification would be from fingerprints. Oh? Now, Mr. Bauer, I'm not so much interested in who you are as in proving that you're not John Reardon. If you volunteered a set of fingerprints, it would save me a great deal of work and you a great deal of trouble. Well, sure, why not? <laughs> We drove downtown together to George Hanley's office and used the portable fingerprint kit. I took a complete set of Frank Bauer's prints he attached. I thanked him for his time and trouble, and he left. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversational reactions. There had been a moment when I was sure he wasn't Frank Bauer. On the other hand, I was sure that he wasn't John Ridden. That cuts it, Johnny. Right thumb and index prints don't match at all. Oh, not even close, George. And I thought I was getting somewhere. I found out he was never in Toledo, or at least never registered or licensed as an engineer. Well, these prints do it. When are you going home, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. There's no reason to stick around any longer. This is crazy. You proved your case with the prints. He was too anxious to help me prove it, Georgie. You ask any ordinary man on the street two personal questions about himself, and he'll tell you to go jump in the lake. You ask him for his fingerprints, and he's liable to smash you. So? Get on him. Stay with him 24 hours a day. Get a couple of other men. It'll cost you money. Get busy. Expense account item nine, $200, detective service. I didn't believe Frank Bowers. I didn't believe his background. And most of all, I didn't believe his fingerprints. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, another man comes to Denver. He doesn't check in a hotel or carry luggage. At least not much luggage. Just a 38 Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Western Union, Mr. Dollar. Message for you from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, go ahead. Received your air special regarding investigation of the Chesapeake matter. You've proved Frank Bowers of Denver is not John Ridden of Baltimore. Fingerprints don't lie, therefore logical to believe John Ridden really dead. 
Come on home. Your expenses are running too high. That's signed Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Or should I mail this to you? No, that's all right. Can I send an answer? Yes, sir. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. Fingerprints don't lie, but people do. All the time. For all sorts of reasons. It may be finished as far as you're concerned, but I'm just beginning. Love, Johnny. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. I'd sent out to prove that John Reardon had not died back in 1950 in a boat accident on Chesapeake Bay. To prove that he was still very much alive in the person of one Frank Bowers, currently living here in Denver, Colorado. Everything, all I could learn of the man's history, reports from his neighbors, friends, even his fingerprints... Everything indicated he really was Frank Bowers. And yet, for some fool reason or other, I wasn't convinced. Expense account continued. Item 10, 63 bucks for one overcoat. Denver can be a very cold city when the wind comes in from the north and it decides to snow. Almost as cold as the damp wind off Chesapeake Bay on a certain day back in 1950. Hi. Hiya, George. How's it going? Well, I watched Bowers' house from six last night till two this morning. He read a book last night in the living room. He made a phone call, and then he went to bed. And then I went home and went to bed. How many men have you got working? Two others beside myself. We're keeping an eye on Bowers around the clock. I go on again at six. Okay, good. I don't know why, Johnny. He isn't your guy, and you know it. Fingerprints proved it. We can watch him from now till doomsday, and nothing's going to change that. Oh, look, don't you start, Georgie. Huh? I got a wire from my home office this morning telling me to close it up and come on home. Why don't you close it up and come on home? I like to make dough. I'm in the private detective business, but I hate to see an old pal doing a lot of work on nothing. Why don't you shut up? Sure. We can go on like this forever, can't we, Johnny? Ah. Goodbye, Johnny. I walked around the streets of Denver trying to enjoy the sights. But mostly, I wasn't enjoying anything. I was thinking about the whole case from beginning to end. And my only reason for hanging on and being stubborn about it was the fact that Frank Bowers had been too anxious to cooperate. Too anxious to help me prove so easily that he was not John Reardon. And then something else happened. He got anxious once more. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, this is Frank Bowers. Oh, Hello. You didn't tell me where you were stopping. Phoned everywhere in town. <laughs> Wondered how you made out. Made out? Yeah, with my fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they don't match at all. Oh, then I'm not your man. Guess not, Mr. Bowers. Well, I was just curious. Didn't hear from me after you took the sample of my prints. Oh, well, that was pretty nice of you to help me out. Uh, how can I thank you? <laughs> well, uh, you could buy me a drink if you want to. Hey, you're on. All right, meet you at six at the ship's tavern. It was the voice of a confident man again. An overconfident man. The kind who sandbags in a poker game, who knows about a boat ride and a horse race. And so help me, I knew I was right about him. Expense account item 11, $14, booze. For Frank Bowers and myself in the ship's tavern. The same bar, incidentally, where a week before, a close friend of the deceased John Reardon had run into Bowers and sworn he was John Reardon. When Bowers came in, he was followed by George Hanley, as per my instructions. I saw George pick a stool at the far end of the bar. Well, I suppose you'll be packing up and leaving the old Mile High City pretty quick now, huh? Did I say that, Frank? No, no, but I just suppose it. You will, won't you? Oh, I haven't decided yet. What do you think I should do? Huh? 
I said, what do you think I should do? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, maybe I'm just kidding myself. But you don't seem like the kind of fellow you should be somehow. No, I don't. Huh? No. Now, you were too nice about answering questions when I came out to your house the other day. Too nice about letting me fingerprint you so I could compare the samples with John Reardon's prints. Too nice about calling up and asking how it all came out. Came out bad, thank you. <laughs> I'm a pretty nice fellow. <laughs> yeah, that's what the book says. <laughs> uh, what book? I had a private detective friend make one up on you before I even got here. Friends, enemies, money, and whatnot. All very nice. Mm, of course it is. You know what your trouble is, Dolly? You, you don't trust anybody. I'm a nice fella, and you don't trust me. You don't believe what you see. I believe the fingerprints don't match, if that's what you mean. You're the bird I don't believe. Hey, should I get sore? If you want to. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know why? Because I'm a nice fellow. <laughs> sure you are. But you ought to get mad when a man calls you a liar. Oh, uh, you didn't call me a liar. I meant to. You're a liar. You know what? I'm not a nice fellow all the time. I'd kind of like to hit you in the face or something right now. You're kneeling. Am me. I? Uh-huh. I think I better call up a girl I know, see what she's doing for dinner. Well, see if she's got a friend. No, no, you're too nasty, friend. You sit tight. Order me a drink. I'll be back in a jiffy. He's a little drunk. Sure he is, George. He's also worried. Any particular reason for getting him that way, Johnny? Yes, he's using the booth in the lobby. Scoot out there and see if you can get a line on who he might be calling. Right. A long ten minutes later, Frank Bowers came back to the bar. He was weaving a little when he got on the stool next to me. George Hanley followed him back inside and took his place at the end of the bar again. Uh, she's busy. Took her a long time to tell you that. She's a girl who takes a long time with everything. Oh, what's her name? Huh? What's her name? The girl you just called. Oh, Rita. Rita. Well, here's to Rita. Come on, drink up. You might have to eat with me. I don't want to drink to Rita, and I don't want to have dinner with you. What do you think of that? Huh? I thought you were a nice fella. Remember? God of blazes. Hold on. Hey! Johnny, you may have something with this bird at that. How come, George? That call he just made long distance to Baltimore. I got that much. He said he'd never been there. Didn't know anyone there. Keep an eye on us, Georgie. You bet your pal. Hey, hey, Frank. Hey, hey, look, what's the matter, friend? I just left you, I thought, for good. Oh, come on, I'll buy you dinner. You buy me nothing, Dollar. Go on back to Baltimore. Why don't you? What? Why don't you go back to Baltimore? What's that supposed to mean? Just what it means. Well? well maybe we better talk some more. Fine, huh? fine. My car is in the lot here. Okay. You're after me, aren't you? Well, let's say I met you yesterday to get some facts. Let's say I drank with you tonight to find out what kind of a guy you are. I've done most of the talking up to date. Now it's your turn. Uh-huh. Well? I don't know whether I got anything to say to you. Oh, make up your mind, will you? Look, suppose I were John Ridden. I'm not. But suppose I were. I can't tell you what a court would do about an insurance fraud. No. No, you're just a clumsy ox stumbling around for some answers and you haven't got any yet. Get out of my way. Wait, wait a minute. He's a very handy fella. I didn't want to interfere, Johnny. Stay on him. See where he goes, what he does, Georgie. Hurry. You all right, pal? Sure. Hurry. I wasn't all right at all. Frank Bowers was not only big, but fast, and he caught me off guard. I went back through the hotel lobby up to my room and lay down on the bed, and I waited for the phone to ring. Sooner or later, it would be George Hanley or Frank Bowers' tale reporting some development that had solved the whole case. But the phone didn't ring. Nothing happened. No one phoned. No one came by. I went to sleep about one o'clock.
The next morning, George Hanley called and asked me how I was feeling after the punching session in the parking lot. He reported that Frank Bowers had jumped in his car, driven straight home, and gone straight to bed. Expense account item 12, 48 cents, postage. Cost of mailing a sample of Bowers' fingerprints to Washington, D.C. At 8 o'clock that night, I had another phone call. Hi, baby. This is George Hanley. How do you feel? Okay. What's up, Georgie? I'm still keeping my eye on Frank Bowers. He's nervous, all right. Been staying in the house all day. I can see him walking back and forth in the living room. He must have smoked a package of cigarettes every hour. Uh Uh-huh. Has he used the phone? Yeah, yeah. Looks like long-distance stuff again. You know, place the call, hang up, then wait for the operator to call back. Hmm. Possibly Baltimore again. Possible. How about it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Where are you? Right across the street from his house. Be right out. The heater in my rented car wasn't working that night. I remember that part very well. My feet and hands were numb with the ten below weather when I flicked off the lights and pulled up alongside George Hanley, stationed across the street from Frank Bowers' home. Uh, it's some weather. Yeah. How's Bower doing? I think he's got a visitor with him now, Johnny. Must have showed up while I was calling you. Big guy wrapped in an overcoat. I've seen him move around the room a couple of times. George, let's go in and shake him up. I'm tired of all this. You think he's reared? I don't know, but I want to wind it up one way or the other. Okay. You want to wait for his friend to leave? Nope. No, it's a nutty thing. You're the one who's nutty. You already proved he isn't John Reardon. That's all you wanted. I know, I know. Now I want to prove I'm getting old and crotchety and don't believe what I see in here. Bear with me, Georgie. Sure, pal. You're crazy, but I love you. Hey. Huh? Visitor's leaving. Make him? No. An overcoat and a hat aren't much to go on. He's... Georgie, come on! Hey, Johnny, look out! down, the gun of the man in the overcoat had gone off a couple more times. The nearest bullet came six inches from me. Without my gun, all I could do was hug the ground for cover and try to stay out of his line of fire. The shot deafened me for a moment. When my hearing came back, I heard someone very close to me. It was Georgie. He was dying. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proof that an insurance case is one thing, murder of a pal is something else. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator. Ready with your call to Mr. Pat Kelleher in Baltimore. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Pat. I got your wire. What's all this? What happened? We're still trying to find out. The man calling himself Frank Bowers was killed an hour ago. George Hanley, one of the operatives I had watching him, was killed too. We've got a vague description of the killer. Are you all right? Yeah, but I'm going to be tied up with the police here. Well, you need money for bail or anything like that, just draw a draft on the company. I'll confirm it. Thanks, Pat. Too bad about your friend. Yeah, he was a good guy. I want to find out who killed him. (laughs) 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account continued. Item 13, a quarter, for some aspirin. It turned out to be a long night. Several homicide officers arrived at the double murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the business at hand. Frank Bowers had been shot to death. George Hanley had been shot to death. Lieutenant Tom O'Neill was in charge, a big blonde man who seemed to know what he was about. Okay, let's see that ID again. There you go. Ah, insurance investigator, hmm? That's right. Okay. What was your business here with these two men? My home office in Baltimore had reason to believe that Frank Bowers was really a man named John Reardon. Reardon was supposed to have died five years ago. I was sent out here to investigate it since there had been a $20,000 claim in the matter. Sure, sure. I hired George Hanley to help me out. He was keeping an eye on Frank Bowers. I came out earlier tonight to give my hand, and the shooting began. Any idea who did it? A big man in a top coat and a hat. I really didn't get a look at him, Lieutenant. I was busy with George Hanley. Sure. You carry a gun? Sometimes. I didn't have one tonight. You tried to chase the killer? I said I was busy with my friend. Yeah, that's right, you did. Well, how was your investigation coming along? Frank Bowers' fingerprints didn't match the samples I had for John Reardon. But it didn't satisfy me. There were a lot of things about him personally I couldn't accept. I harassed him a little last night, and he got pretty excited and slugged me. This was after I found out he'd been trying to call Baltimore. Who in Baltimore? I don't know. Well, tell me about this harassing. We'll make a check with the phone company. Well, I needled him purposely, trying to scare him into a blunder. I think I was doing pretty good. I'll never know now. Uh-huh. What else you got to say about your case? Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. It is, eh? Well, that's all I got to say because that's all I know about it. Next time, be careful with your needling tactics. Boy. I was doing what I thought best on the case. Sure you were. You were doing swell. You let a friend of yours get shot down in front of your eyes. Not to mention the other guy. You can't give us a description of the killer or a hint at the motive. Now, maybe George Hanley wasn't a friend of yours at that. Why, you... Dad, take it easy, kiddo. Take it easy. Remember to blow the bell. I'm sorry. You've had quite a night. Nobody in your business or mine knows what's behind the door when he kicks it in. I'm just a cop trying to get straightened out, so I push too hard sometimes. We'll get it taken care of. Nobody walks in a man's house and shoots him down without somebody hearing something or seeing something. I mean, somebody besides you. Now, my men will cover every house in the block, in this whole area, if we have to. Bound to be somebody somewhere. The dogged Lieutenant O'Neill turned out to be 100% correct. In fact, he turned out to be 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murders of Frank Bowers and George Hanley. The first was a man named Randall who had lived across the street. He had seen Bowers open his front door and admit the unknown killer. He said he wore glasses. The second was a paper boy who had come to collect while the killer was there. He stated that the killer and Bowers were arguing when he came up to the door. The third witness, a housewife, gave the most important information as to the man's description. He was a good deal taller than Mr. Bowers. How much taller? Mm, three, four inches at least. I saw him standing in the doorway from here. He had on a brown tweed top coat. My husband has one just like it. How old would you say he was? Mm, Forty-five. Have you ever seen him before? No. Would you know him if you saw him again? Yes, anywhere. You got that good look at him, huh? Yes, the porch light was on. Here's something, Dollar. Lieutenant O'Neill had issued an all-points bulletin based on the combined descriptions given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men had checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to Frank Bowers' home at 8 o'clock in the evening. The cab driver verified the housewife's description of the suspect and added the important information that he'd picked up the man at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had come in on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Oren Williams. Expense account item 14, $8.95. Another long-distance phone call to Baltimore and Pat Kelleher. Well, I'll be darned. Do you have to stay there, John? Of course I have to stay here. I'm a material witness. Not to mention the fact that a pal of mine was shot down. Don't get on your high horse, John. It was just a question. Have any idea what it was all about? Well, at the moment, I'm just sure a guy named Oren Williams flew in, shot up two people, and beat it. If we had Williams, I'd give you the whole thing on a silver platter. You're awfully touchy. Well, this thing has gotten out of hand. Well, 
I won't press you on it anymore, John. You do what you think is best. As far as the company's concerned, it's really not our business anymore, is it? It's our business until it's cleared up. Well, I mean Bowers. He wasn't John Reardon. Dollar? Hold it, Pat. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Here. Let's see. Pat. Yeah? It is our business after all. Huh? The lieutenant here sent a hurry-up request to Washington on some of Bowers' fingerprints I mailed a couple of days ago. They check out. I don't get it. Bowers was John Reardon. Oh. Well. Well, where'd you get the samples of Reardon's prints that didn't check out? From Hugh Bryan, Reardon's attorney. I better call him. Don't you dare. Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Tell me about this fellow, Hugh Bryan. According to the phone company, that's the man Bowers was trying to call in Baltimore. I told him all I knew. And Lieutenant O'Neill listened thoughtfully. It became apparent from that point on, since Bauer's true identity had been established through Army records, that the bulk of the case could be concluded not in Denver, but in Baltimore. Expense account item 16, $216, plane fare and incidentals, Denver to Baltimore. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, checked with the Baltimore police who had been informed of the case by Tom O'Neill in Denver. At his request, they'd taken no action as yet. From the police station, I went directly to Hugh Bryan's residence. The house was English, conservative, and expensive. The fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Elizabeth Reardon did not look so cheerful. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mrs. Reardon. Didn't expect to find you here. No, I suppose not. I never expected to see you again. Elizabeth, I have something to tell you. Don't tell me now, Johnny. It's about your husband. All right. I want to tell Mr. Bryan, too. He's upstairs in his study. Wait. Look, I've done what I thought best about all this, and I'm trying to do what's best now. It doesn't make any difference, Johnny. I'm a married woman again. Huh? Yes. You and I were married this morning. Excuse me. I walked in and watched John Reardon's widow, alias Frank Bowers' widow, now Hugh Bryan's bride, disappear up a column stairway. The news that she had married Hugh Bryan cleared up some of the small doubts in my mind. When Bryan came back down the stairs with her, he looked anything but the happy bridegroom. Hello, Dollar. You're a late caller. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, How did you come out in Denver? Everything okay? No, everything's not okay. Well, uh, what's the matter? Do I have to tell you... I'll run along upstairs, Hugh. It's getting terribly late. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Bryan. There'll be some men out to see you pretty soon, Bryan. Policemen. Oh. Liz. Yes, dear? I think you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Hugh. I wasn't in Philadelphia yesterday, Liz. I was in Denver, Colorado. What? I flew there to see John. He's been alive and living there all this time. You. I'm sorry. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When it gets into court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brian? John Reardon didn't die on that boat. No. He was picked up in a bay by a fishing boat on his way to Florida. They didn't have a radio on the fishing boat. The first port they came to was Charleston. John phoned me from there and told me all about it. Now, this was ten days after we all thought he was dead. That part was all accident. Sure. The rest of it was a little different. Liz, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? Not showing up ever again. Letting everyone think he was really dead. Making you a widow. I don't believe it. He hated his life here. Yes, everything about it. He was in debt right up to his ears... Of course, there was your money, but he... Well, I flew down to Charleston to talk to him. He was like a crazy man. Kept saying there was a way out. I didn't know what he meant at first. Then he came right out and said it was his chance to get away from all the things he hated. He knew how I felt about you then, how I feel about you now. He said I could have you for a price. What was the price? Those checks he got every week from a New York bonding concern? Yes. What did they come to? 25000 a year, regular weekly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Liz. 
Did he come right out and tell you he hated me? He just said he wanted to get away from everything. And it went that way for five years. I believe I asked you to marry me every six months. Yes. But that didn't work out either. And then one day, along came Johnny Dollar. How does it feel to be so efficient, Mr. Dollar? We don't have to go into that, do we? No. I'll admit you did everything to throw me off. And it threw me off. Especially the fingerprints you provided. Didn't John Reardon insist his name was Frank Bowers and do everything he could to make you believe that was true? He did too much to make me think it was true. Where is he now? Where's John? He's dead, Mrs. Bryan. Oh. Truly dead now. He was shot to death last night by Mr. Bryan. Mr. Bryan also shot a friend of mine, didn't you, Bryan? Yes. John got scared, called me, said he was going to tell everything to Dollar, blow the whole thing. Hugh... All I wanted out of this was you, Liz. He didn't want you. I did. Last week, you decided to marry me. It took you five years to do that. And it took him one afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. The proof that John Reardon's widow is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent insurance claim is a matter for Eastern Fidelity to decide. The matter of Hugh Bryan and two murders is a matter for the courts. Expense account, item 17, same as item 1. Expenses from Baltimore to Hartford. Item 18, $89 even. Car rentals, miscellaneous, etc. Expense account total, $1,124.98. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, a quiet, sleepy little town in Mexico and a beautiful senorita that... Well, things didn't stay quiet and sleepy for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, D.J. Thompson, High Everback, Will Wright... John Daner, Tony Barrett, Paul Dubov, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>